tried to list up in my mind, so I probably missed something, uh, the different types of ratios and or equations you see in chemistry. This looks uh, intense, but for all practical purposes, this is way less than like a typical math class, right? You, you couldn't fit the entire semester of math onto a single three by four foot um, board. So a big picture here, if you're looking at what we're trying to do for chemistry, we're really trying to move you away from equations and move you into uh, the patterns, the trends, and the relationships. So here's the hard part about stoichiometry. <clears throat> There's no equation. It's doing math with absolutely no equations. It's fundamentally canceling units. If your units cancel, logically, and there's ratios that actually express those units, then you've done stoichiometry okay, uh, or well. So we don't want this. <clears throat> I did put them up here. In terms of the general expression of these, we don't need to go back through, but in essence, these three are the same. This is your new one. <clears throat> Temperature conversions, use these in lab settings. And then fundamentally, we've tried to, <clears throat> and I've argued maybe potentially the entire semester, lowering the potential energy maximizes stability. And that comes back to this Coulomb's law expression, or some derivation of that law, actually. So this is it. This is what we've gone for. This would be kind of uh, unit one, uh, beginning of the year, unit conversion of density, molar mass, Avogadro's number. We picked up percent comp kind of in unit two, mole bridge in unit three, molarity only recently. So you've dabbled in those a little bit before, but now it's time to put them all together. Uh, these three additional concepts here, uh, this is something additionally that you will be filing away as you're doing these switch geometry problems is always balance the chemical equation 100% of the time. If you don't balance first, you cannot, your math cannot, cannot be accurate unless it's a lucky guess. 100% breaks down if you don't have a balanced equation. It really does. Does it help to know how to classify reactions if there's a problem that says ethanol combust in a certain amount of oxygen? Yeah, you got to know what the products ultimately are and how much of those products are ultimately formed. And then I'm going to tie in a little bit of acid-base chemistry. That's an entire two weeks. Uh, I love it, and, and I've mentioned this point before, but uh, I think it ties together all of your chemistry knowledge really, really well. And that's what makes it challenging, and that's why it's removed typically from a first semester course. However, it's okay for us to do general calculations with them and just understand the fundamentals of acids and bases. So you already have something. This is hydrochloric acid here. What unit is this? This is, what did we just do, eight? So I think it's nine. Even know. I think it's nine. I'm not even gonna write it down if you don't know. <laughs> not even. Yeah, it's stoichiometry. That does nothing for us. I'm gonna ask what you're gonna How How's she say it? Stoichiometry. Stoichiometry. That's, she's probably right. She's from the South. <laughs> what? what does that have to do with it? Do you know what the South goes, right? Yes. She is. I haven't seen her wrong yet. I haven't yeah. seen her wrong yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, remember, whenever you have a binary acid, uh, you say hydroic acid. So just nomenclature alone. If you had something like H2SO4, uh, how would you say that? H2SO4. H2SO4, that's like sulfuric acid. acid. Okay. So whenever you have an oxy acid, oxy acids contain oxygen. This is a special polyatomic ion. You do not say hydro. You just say sulfuric acid in addition to that. Okay, um, and, and then the basis of acid-based chemistry, there's way more to it than this. Acids donate the hydrogen ion, and bases accept the hydrogen ion. So bases are literally defined as proton acceptors, and acids are proton donors. Okay, that's sufficient for us. We'll kind of leave it there. Again, there's way more to it than that, but that's okay. All right, uh, so let's do two calculations. We do need to balance them, and in the same moment, we need to predict what the products of those are. There are two fundamental questions that stoichiometry ultimately answers. The first question is, how much product is produced? And in doing that question, uh, that's a very feasible industrial scale question as well. And then the other question that kind of sits here is how much reactant is required. If, if 
you want to make the argument, every single business, and I really do mean that, it doesn't matter what type of business you run, if you are selling a product out there as a business, then how much of that product do you have available to the world, to your consumers, right? Then in addition to that, what am I going to need to be able to have that product? Is it a building? How many buildings? Is it employees? How many employees, right? You could just use that question at every single fundamental level. You really, really could. So potentially here the argument, and I'm just going to, I'll pick on Mia for a second, but um, did you, you said statistics, but the business side of it, right? Uh, so Mia's questions would constantly come back to this, but just more from a statistical standpoint. So analyzing the marketplace and looking at how that impacts actual business, those are these two fundamental questions wrapped up into there. So chemistry is the same thing as every, I would argue, thing legitimate in this world that's trying to give or sell a product. Okay, so focus on these two. These are the two we'll try to do. Let's start simple and work our way up to hard. Let's introduce it today. We'll do some examples today. I'll give you some practice today, but tomorrow, at that point, is probably just an all work day, so it is uh, Thursday. And then Friday, we'll try to do a quiz over it and start gas laws. So try to wrap this up within the next couple days or so. Okay. Uh, Acid-base reactions, if you look at the proton moving towards the base, uh, the base component, basic component of this is the hydroxide. So hydrogen plus hydroxide makes water. So this is H2O here. And then just in a similar way, the ions that are left over are sodium and sulfate. <clears throat> What's the requirement for an acid-base reaction is that you produce a salt. So a salt is a metal with a non-metal component. And that is how you define an ionic compound is the word salt. Does water have to be made? No. Is it likely to be made? Absolutely. So same thing here. We have table salt, uh, particularly on this one. We could do the phase states of both of these by looking at our solubility rules. Because this is at room temperature, the liquid water will persist instead of some other phase state of water. And now we have this conversation. Okay. All right. Um, again, don't memorize this. Let me try to develop a pattern for you. Um, maybe you watch for a second and then you can decide where on your paper you want to put this. It doesn't have to be right there. Okay. One option is this. It, let's forget the phase states for a moment and just say uh, that impacts this decision. G uh, is a gram. So what if you're given the mass of hydrochloric acid and you're given the mass of sodium hydroxide? Okay, so you actually have powdered forms of that. If you're given two masses, you could ask the question, how much could you produce? How much table salt could you produce, right? That's a mass to mass to mass expression. In a similar way, we could have done, well, if I know maybe like uh, the volume of this one, and I have some volume of this one, what volume of this could we produce? All right, so now you're just changing the units there. Or you can mix and match. Maybe we have a situation where you know the mass of this, you have the volume of that, and you want to find the volume of this. Or mix and match it the other way. You have the mass, you have the volume, and you want to find mass. It doesn't matter. Legitimately, what I'm just trying to say there is you're going to see many different problems with many different units. As long as you know something about each of the reactants, you have the ability to calculate the product. So this is the first question. How much product is being produced given some amount of reactants? <clears throat> um, let's simplify this for a moment and do something like, uh, if this is the bread, and let's say this is, I don't know, do you guys eat peanut butter sandwiches? Yeah. Okay. I but just, you think we are. Yeah, <laughs> but no jelly though. Well, you, you oh. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. No, you know, like you're, you're, you're a little hungry, but you're not hungry enough to eat anything else. So you just need something to fill you up. Grab a piece of bread, slap on some peanut butter, smash it together. No, you put bananas in it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's pretend you do the peanut butter. Um, in this in this example, it, let, let's say you have one loaf of bread, and you have uh, one jar of peanut butter, a typical size jar. Okay, let's say it's like this big. And you ask the question, how many sandwiches can you make ultimately? Notice one of the, the common problems, sandwich, sorry. Uh, one of the common problems with this uh, type of expression, arguably, is if you present this to Jim Kim, you would see the value of one. And maybe, for the sake of argument, let's go ahead and do a 10 here. And say, uh, they would selectively choose 
that 1 is less than 10, therefore 1 must limit how many sandwiches you make. While that's true, uh, in this calculation, what if we did something like this? <clears throat> if you add half a jar of peanut butter and one loaf of bread, does the peanut butter still limit the amount of sandwiches you make? Based on your everyday experiences, can you make a, six sandwiches out of a half a jar of peanut butter? Yeah. yeah, you can make more than that out of a half a jar of peanut butter, right? So is it always this number that's the tiniest limits the reaction? No, you actually have to do the calculation. So in theory, what you do, and uh, not in theory, in practical application, is you say, given this much bread, how many sandwiches can be produced? You actually do that calculation. 12, 12 slices of bread, that gives us six sandwiches total, right? Let's just simplify to that. All right. If you do the peanut butter calculation, if I could use the ratio, it says on the back of one serving size is one teaspoon of peanut butter. Let's say half a jar still has 20 teaspoons of peanut butter in it, so we can make 20 sandwiches out of there. So which one limits the reaction? Of course, in this kind of fictitious example, it's the bread. But what you see, we had to compare both reactants to ask the question, which one gives us the least amount of product possible? So this question of how much product is produced is six sandwiches. We couldn't produce 20, we didn't have enough bread. If you go buy more bread, you can make more sandwiches, fair? And this ultimately is called the limiting reactant. Remember that word maybe back from your days of chemistry? Did you get this class? We have like, yeah. we've had this exact same lecture yeah. at one point in the past. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, yeah, this we're starting from the fundamental and then we'll progress to the college level, but we're just trying to approach it as if you haven't seen it. But limiting reactant, this is the language you would use. Which one limits the reaction? It's the bread. So we just put LR here for limiting reactant. Uh, flip those numbers around. You, again, we could do that 10 jars of peanut butter to make us, I don't know, 150 sandwiches-ish. One loaf of bread still so gives us a six sandwiches. Is a loaf of bread the limiting reactant? Yes, it is still, but if we had, uh, let's say, 1.0 times 10 to the fifth loaves of bread because it comes in a truck overseas from somewhere. Now, is that going to limit the reaction? Eh, no, probably not, right? Yeah. If you have 10,000 loaves of bread, it's probably the peanut butter at that position. Okay. All right, so that's what we're doing just now with the chemistry mindset instead of a loaf of bread. Okay. Let's try a few uh, examples here. Let's say you have, mm, let's start with mass, and then I'll come back to the milliliter one. Because that one's a little harder. Let's say you have uh, iron three chlorine. Let's put it as a solid, and somehow, not all these reactions are actually gonna happen. Let's just try to make a point out of it. And you have lead uh, nitrate, lead two nitrate as a solid. Uh, all right, if this is a double displacement reaction, which these are solids, so it's not really, but what would you form? What would you form? This double displacement? The, the chloride, okay. iron, iron, iron. Again, you might go ahead and in your notes say, the reality is this won't happen, but let's try to keep everything as a solid, just for this first example, to make Okay, first thing you do, 100% of the time, is balance the equation. What do we need? How many more? Um, we do? How many more? Um, well, we need at least one more. So, two. two. Well, no, three. And then two on the other side. We have one iron? We have one iron? Oh, uh, never mind. I'm we need two. Nine. Do two on that one for chlorine. Okay. So, two chlorides. Three. That gives us six, right? And that's six. Three lead, three lead. Three times two is six nitrates. Three times two is six nitrates. Two iron, two yeah. iron, right? Okay. All right, so balance the chemical equation. Come up with the simplest whole number ratio. Now, uh, back on this page, where you, this is your first step you should always do, balancing chemical equations. Um, what you could argue is, uh, Mulbridge, 100% of the time. 
or some version of the mole bridge. You will need to use that in a stoichiometric calculation always. Percent composition has that embedded in it. If you use percent comp, you'll get to the same answer, but you should be thinking, get to moles, get to moles, get to moles. So if I give you the mass of this, let's say uh, 10 grams of the iron chloride, let's go to the five grams of the lead nitrate. Uh, let's ask the question, how much of this compound can we produce? Okay. All right, two calculations because there are two reactants. The first calculation, how much, using this much bread, how many sandwiches? The second calculation, this amount of peanut butter, how many sandwiches could we make? It doesn't matter which one you do first, but you do have to do them both. Okay. All right, this one, uh, if we go from the iron three chloride, do some unit cancellations. We're thinking to ourselves, get to moles, get to moles, get to moles. Uh, because the only way to begin to talk about, if you have information about one thing and you need to know something about a totally different compound, you have to have a mole bridge. So we need to be able to get grams to moles, ultimately. This is a good time if you haven't been yet writing in your chemical formulas, go ahead and start doing that just so you can keep track of where you're really at in your calculation. So this will be our mole bridge. And moles of what? What goes here? The lead chloride. Okay. And now uh, to get from moles to grams, do our molar mass. And we have the mass of the compound. So in essence, this much bread produces this many sandwiches, right? That's what we've said here. We had to use the mole bridge, and we're thinking to ourselves, get to moles, get to moles, get to moles. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna put this one, uh, I'll put it up here, since it's getting pretty low. What did I say, 10 grams or five? And then let's set this next one up. So we have grams of lead to nitrate. Cancel some units. Think to yourself, get to moles, get to moles, get to moles. Okay. Now we can do our mole bridge because there's the only way to talk about the peanut butter and the sandwiches is to use the mole bridge. And then remembering we still wanted to find the masses. All right, so this black one is given some amount of peanut butter, how many sandwiches can you produce, right? So two questions, you have the bread, you have the peanut butter, how many sandwiches are possible? All right, how do we know which one's the limiting reactant? Trick question. You don't, you, don't. you don't. You don't. You cannot look at these numbers. You cannot look at these numbers and try to figure out just by looking at those numbers and say, oh, that's less. That's the one you're acting. Because it totally depends upon the mole bridge and it totally depends upon the mass of the compounds that you're working with there. But at least for the numbers here, the lead nitrate, that's five grams. The molar mass, whatever that would end up being. Uh, the, mold, the mold bridge, yeah, that's coming. Can somebody do that for me? Okay. Uh, you can keep a few decimals, I'll go there. 
And then uh, here, can you do this one for us while you have the calculator? 7284. <coughs> Two seventy-seven. Two seventy-eight. Oh, one off. Yeah. Point what? One zero six. Okay. All right, and then the mole breaks here. The balance coefficients. There are three moles of lead nitrate for every three moles of lead chloride. And that, could you have simplified that to one to one? Yes. Three hundred to three hundred. Yes. As long as it's one to one relationship or three to three relationship. You're good to go there. Okay. Uh, down here, 10 grams of the iron three chloride. Why'd you? Okay, never mind. Okay. The iron three chloride's molar quantity is two moles of iron three chloride for every three moles of lead two chloride. Three to two relationship. This is still the 278. This is still the one. Plus that. So you're here. Okay. Uh, something you want to punch through those numbers? Let's see what we get. So, as a final answer. Just like uh, three point something, three point eight. Push. I got four point two for that. And then close. And then twenty five point seven for the. Um, yeah, twenty five point seven. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Obviously, that's a linear reactant. So yeah, which one is a linear reactant? The lead, lead nitrate. The lead nitrate is the one that limits the amount of products that can be produced. So we would just say that this is the limiting. Reacting here. Okay. We could have produced 27.5 or 25.7, but we needed more lead nitrate to do that. We didn't have enough ultimately to do that. Yeah. Well, we have like a Google form for it. Not Google form. I'll give you a you know, hard copy. But uh, in this calculation, tell me which ratio you did not need to figure out which one's the limiting reactant. You have two calculations. Uh, iron nitrate. Nitrate, 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 nitrate. What do you mean? Because left them in the moles unit. The if this anything. and this are taken out, does it affect which one is the limiting reactant? Mm -hmm. No. Why? Because it's still the same value, it's just in a different unit. Yeah, do a whole bunch of stuff and multiply by 278. Do a whole bunch of stuff and multiply by 278. In a mathematical expression, if you multiply by the same number on both functions, it has the same impact on both functions there. So <clears throat> the reason I say that is because if instead of going to mass, what if you really wanted to go to atoms? Um, yeah. Atoms. You would have had to go from, so this would have, you would have kept going. You would have been like, uh, actually let's say microliters. So it would have gone from grams to milliliters. It would have done milliliters to microliters. And then you would have found your microliters of your lead. You would have done the same thing down here. So you would have done one, two, three, four, five, six more calculations, ratios, when you didn't need to do those in the first place. So one of the easiest things, I think, is to stop at the mole bridge if the question just asks you which one's the limiting reactant. Okay. Then if the question wants to know the mass amount of this, you know this is the limiting reactant, now do that one extra ratio. That's there. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, okay, what if this is an excess? What impact does that have on this question? Of which one is the linear reactant? How do you know the other one's the linear reactant? How do you know that? If one's an excess, then you Perfect. The, the excess implies there's so much of it there, you never, ever, ever will become close to using all of it. As a typical example, what's in this room in excess right now that you never will use up? Air, right? Legitimately, chemical reactions in your body are using it nonstop for 20 people, and we never will use all the air in this room. 
so air is in excess. That's a good thing. Otherwise, it's like, okay, you take a breath, and then I'll hold my breath. You breathe again, and then I'll sleep, hold my breath. Okay, my turn. Okay, your turn, right? Because we have to limit how much oxygen is consumed in here total. So if uh, one of the arguments is this, uh, if I had AB plus CD, all right, plus a whole bunch of stuff produces this, produces the, okay. You get the point. I've seen this on a standardized assessment. They had about 12 reactants, 12 reactants, and they had like 15 products. And then they said, calculate the limiting reactant. And it's like, wow, 12 different reactions, how are you even going to do that? But if you read the problem, they said the only thing that is not in excess, this is the wording of the problem, was, and they chose one of these compounds. Everything else was excess, so that cannot be the limiting reactant, right? Choose the one that has a number to it, <laughs> and it's not in excess, fine. That's the limiting reactant. You even need to do a single calculation to get that. Okay? Yeah. Kind of cool. All right, uh, let's do one more example, and then I'll set you free to work, but let's use milliliters and molarity. This was mass to mass sort of thing, so let's try to do the uh, slightly different. Okay, volume times molarity. What do you know? Volume times molarity. Moles. Moles. And if you have moles, get to moles to get to the mole bridge, right? Okay, so let's do the basic one. All right, let's say you have 10 milliliters of a 1.5 molar solution of sulfuric acid. Let's say you have uh, 20 milliliters of a one25 molar solution. Which one's the limiting reactant? Okay. Uh, do I need to define which product you need to find? Think about that carefully. So here's what I'm saying. Let's assume this is a limiting reactant for a moment. If this limits how much water is produced, would that also limit how much sodium sulfate is produced? So once you're the limiting reactant, are you always the limiting reactant? No. no. What do you think? I don't think so. No. What do you think? Think about that carefully, though. Because in our peanut butter and bread example, it would be like one loaf of bread limits how many sandwiches can be produced. Does one loaf of bread limit how many sandwich crushed up? One bread sandwiches you can make. Peanut butter toast. What do you call those? Like meatballs? That, yeah, meatballs. Does it limit how many sandwich balls you could actually produce as well? So this is the flat sandwich, this is the meatball style. Does it oh limit it? Oh my god, no. I was just going for a song. It's not always a limiting reactant. You get the point. No, but it is though. Right? Wait, really? Yeah. What? Once you're the limiting reactant, <laughs> you're always. What is going on? Here. I mean, um, it would still limit cheese. the amount of like things you were making in general. Because the... What would be a good example of that? <laughs> not know. sandwich balls. <laughs> <laughs> I think he literally just wanted you to get like crushed up. I'm a little bit scared. Like, red and just roll it. In it's always a good idea. What? Mm. What are you doing? Really? Are I'm limiting sorry. reactions always there? Oh. Like. Ew! Type. What are you doing? Um, bike. How many frames? <laughs> frame, two frames per bike. Dude, what is this? I don't know. Why? <laughs> It's hard not to do chemistry. Uh, one bike frame, if that's the limiting reactant, you produce one bike. Why would your frame Which be also it? means the bike can only have a certain number of chains on it, right? So if you limit how many bikes you can make, it also limits how many chains you have on that bike. Yeah? You could make many more bikes with lots and lots of tires. And that would mean you have lots and lots of bikes being made, which means you have lots and lots of chains on those bikes, right? So if you're in excess for one thing, you're in excess for all of them. If you're limiting one thing, you're limiting all of them. So once the limiting reactant, always the limiting reactant. What a cool shirt that would be someday. So, <coughs> Maybe we can make that for our seniors before we graduate. So limiting reactants will always limit yes. the tires. Yes. Yes. All right, so it doesn't matter which product we look at, let's choose one. Uh, water, maybe a little bit hard here. 
uh, just because we have to use Is that a plus sign or a second arrow? Where? This? <laughs> yes. That's a plus sign. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> right? Let's say this. Uh, and let's figure out the mass. Let's change the phase state to make it easier. Let's go milligrams. Oh, yeah, let's just change the entire phase state to compound. We just precipitate it out. I'll just filter it out. Okay. Okay. Um, milliliters of sulfuric acid and milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Two calculations because we have two different reactions. Three calculations for three reactions, four calculations for four. What are we trying to get to right now? Get to what, get to what, get to what. Whenever you compare, we want to get to milligrams. Whenever you compare one thing to something else, you need a mole bridge. So we need to be able to get to moles, get to moles, get to moles. Whenever you see a prefix, most likely you're doing a unit conversion. So this is sulfuric acid solution. Okay. What goes here? We're trying to get to moles. Whatever you want. Sure, let's try it. If I use grams, what's this ratio in words? What's it represent? Mass by volume. No, oh, what's this? Mass by volume? Density. Density. Yeah. So if we knew the density of sulfuric acid, that'd be fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but we don't, so maybe not. Let's put atoms here, right? Because then the argument would be like, oh, we could go atoms to moles. And then we can do like moles to grams, right? And keep going. What's this ratio in words? Trick question. Is it not a ratio? It's not a ratio. Yeah, you don't have this ratio. It doesn't exist. So even though units would cancel, logically, do we have this ratio available? No, nope, so we can't do that. So even though we can put whatever we want there, we still have to ask the question, what should go there? Moles. Moles? No, you're right. It's actually how I do problems too. So I just put something there and then I ask the question. Does it make sense? Yeah, it's a good strategy. Yes, it does. Yeah, absolutely. Do I need to keep going if this is just well, which one is the one in reacting? No. Nope. I'll stop there for a moment. Okay. Uh, no leaders of sodium hydroxide solution. Whenever you see a prefix, most likely a unit conversion. Are we gonna have time to work on the worksheet today? Probably not. What? It's only like 40 minutes. Yeah. We'll just have to finish up after. Okay. Right? So I just set it up very similarly. This is volume. This is molarity. Volume times molarity gives us moles. Insert mole bridge. And you have the same thing on the bottom. All right, let's crank through this calculation and see. We have 10 milliliters of sulfuric acid, uh, one liter is 1,000 milliliters. The molarity is 1.5 moles of sulfuric acid per one liter of solution. The mole bridge here, we need to balance our equation. So uh, there are two or we need two moles of sodium for two moles of sodium. One mole of sulfate, one mole of sulfate. This gives us two hydrogens plus two more is four. That's four hydrogens, two oxygens, two oxygens that are separate from the sulfate. Or sulfate has four plus two is six, two oxygens plus four is six. Okay. So the moles of sodium sulfate is one. The moles of sulfuric acid is one. One to one relationship. Do the same thing here. 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, 1,000 milliliters to one liter, 1.25 moles per one liter of solution. Sodium sulfate is a one, sodium hydroxide is a two. Good. Okay, uh, 10 divided by 1,000 is 100, so 0 0.01 uh, times 3 halves. You get it? I don't think so. Um, so what would I say? Three halves, what would that be? 30 divided by 2 times 1,000, 30 divided by 2,000. Uh, somebody help. 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 The one says anything. For which 
<laughs> and literally no one. For the H2 vessel <laughs> war, it should be 0 0.015. Zero one five. Okay. And this one, what do we get here? Zero point zero one two five. What? Yeah, should we? I should say. Okay. All right. So that's the moles of the sodium sulfate. Which one limits the reaction? The one that is tinier. So this one limits the reaction. So this is the limiting reactant in this calculation. Right. That one. And now, if we want to figure out the mass amount. We don't do anything to this, we do stuff to this. We need to be able to get from moles to grams, and grams to milligrams. Right. Okay. So figure out the molar mass, the formula mass, etc., and do a unit conversion. Um, how could we have very quickly, not doing any of this math, figured out the limiting reactant given this information? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Moles per liter. Keep going. So the one with the smaller molarity is less concentrated, so there's less of it. Keep going. That could, I mean, yes, that's true in this example. But remember, uh, and to your point though, if we go with the tinier number, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the limiting reactant. We just need that step to the, the mole bridge. Yeah. So there's the mole bridge thing. What's your net ionic equation here? What are your spectator ions? This is a liquid. So it's not a precipitate, but it did change the phase state of the hydroxide, which was aqueous and the hydrogen. So sodium and sulfate are your spectator ions. Those are still dissolved in solution. We changed that. We said it precipitated out, but ultimately those are dissolved, right? Solubility rules. So let's look at our hydrogen here. <coughs> hydrogen ion plus the hydroxide ion produces water. <coughs> the ratio is one to one. You have two, you have two hydrogens <coughs> and you have two hydroxides. You can make two waters like this. <coughs> Missed it again. Uh, so do you even have to add any of those coefficients if they all like Okay, now look at this though. Um, if you have more hydrogen ion present, right? Isn't that what 1.5 means? There's more hydrogen than there is hydroxide. Do you need twice as much sodium hydroxide as you do the sulfuric acid solution if this has twice as much hydrogen in it? So let's say this, for every, do this, do this thought process. If this is uh, sulfuric acid, there are two moles of hydrogen ion in there for every, or there's 1.5 moles of hydrogen ion in there for every one liter of solution. Fair? And then you do the same thing for the sodium hydroxide. There are 1.25 moles of OH. So will this come out to be a, a good reaction in terms of this ratio? This is a one to one to one ratio. Or do I have a variation from that? You have less of that. I have less of that. So I need this to be more concentrated. Or what else do I need? You have more of that. Or I need more of it. So the question is, in there, can we just by looking at these numbers go, I doubled my volume of sodium hydroxide. That means I have way more sodium hydroxide, but the concentration is less. So if this was like a three molar thing here, hey, what's up, Nina? Yeah, you just need it? Go for it, what do you got there? Oh, fancy, from Panera? Did you hook her up from Panera? What, no, I did not. Why not? How would I get her a sandwich like the next day? It'd be all gross. Um, I'm probably sure. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's gonna be this good. You don't want to. What is it though? What kind of sandwich? Uh, what is wrong with the microwave? It uh, it kind of does that whenever. Like, <laughs> 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 
See, I told you yeah. you wouldn't care. Yeah, it's like, definitely. What do you mean? I'm not sure. 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 I'm not